Good evening. Praise the Lord, we had a great trip. And when I say we, I'm talking about myself, Chuck Springer, and Travis Harper, and Dave Rose, the pastor of Gooding Springs uh, in Idaho. We um, were there a, a, what, a couple of weeks ago, and praise the Lord that uh, because of your prayers and because of what you helped in supporting our mission, we had a great mission. We accomplished what God called us to do, and we uh, ministered to over 250 people in two villages and had over 100 make decisions to follow Jesus, become his disciples, praise the Lord. We were able to give uh, two study Bibles to um, a couple of pastors in each one of these villages, and also a couple of proclaimers. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the proclaimers as we go through this. But again, we just wanted to thank you because without your prayers and support, we wouldn't be able to do it. We're going as your representatives of Joshua Springs Calvary Chapel, and so um, we ask that you would just continue to pray for the missions that God's called us to. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, Mike and Fawn Stevens. They are missionaries there. They uh, are part of a, a group called Hella Mission or Hella Vida and they're flying helicopters into these remote villages. And praise the Lord that uh, God has opened the door for them to be able to fly into these villages and be welcomed by the people there. And uh, there's over 100 uh, villages that uh, they have access to with the helicopter. The helicopter is the only way they can reach these people. Um, to be able to walk in or hike in would take... Uh, probably over a month or two, and just to be able to carry all the provisions to do that is, would n be nearly impossible. So what they're doing is a work in these last days. And, and how many know that this is right now as we um, are speaking here, uh, we're in the last days. How many know that uh, we don't have that many, much time, that many days left before Jesus is coming back for his church? And uh, God has uh, a message for us, and I'd like to share that with you in uh, Matthew 24. Um, starting at verse 3, the disciples asked Jesus, tell us when will these things be? That is, you're returning. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age, the age of dispensation? And that's what we're in right now, of dispensing or taking the gospel into all over the world into these nations that haven't yet had an opportunity to hear and see and receive Jesus. Anyway, Jesus went on to say, take heed that no one dece deceives you. Now there uh, is a lot of deception going on, a lot of false religions, but uh, God is in control. He's on the throne, and praise the Lord, God is doing a powerful work in these last days, and anyone who's hunger, hungering and thirsting for God, God will give him every opportunity. If The Lord says, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me, and I'll give you a new heart to know me. That's in Jeremiah. And, and God desires more than anything else that people come to repentance, you know, uh, he doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to know him and, and spend eternity in heaven. And God's given us this great commission to go into the world and preach the gospel. Anyway, in verse 6, um, actually verse 5, for many <clears throat> will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And <clears throat> you will... Hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Um, I've had the privilege of being in over 50 countries, and uh, the places we go are 
remote places. We go to the poorest of the poor, people that uh, don't have access to electricity, running water. Uh, in other words, they, they can't watch television. Some of them may have s cell phones. And it, it's, it's really amazing to see uh, these very poor people with cell phones. But uh, for the most part, they're not able to really hear and see the gospel. These are very remote places. And in these places, because they're um, so remote, uh, most of the places, uh, the people are suffering. Uh, and in India and in uh, Africa, I've seen people starving to death um, just because of the, the droughts and, the, and because that causes famine. Also, pestilences. Now, if you look up the word pestilence in a dictionary, you'll find that it means a disease that breaks down the immune system of the host. And AIDS falls under that category, as well as malaria. And it's rampant in so many countries. Uh, even in Papua, um, there was a young man that we prayed for in the first village that was suffering from a severe case of malaria. And praise the Lord, uh, Mike Stevens and his partner, uh, Tom Pilots, went back a few days after we left and <clears throat> picked this man up and took him to a hospital where he got some good care. Uh, and from what I understand, he was able to recover. And so... Um, God is using Christians. Uh, when we were in uh, Haiti uh, in 1999, uh, the voodoo's uh, leadership pretty well had the people in bondage. But when we came back in 2012, we saw because there was a major earthquake and because of um, people like Mike uh, and other helicopter pilots and other ministries that came in and helped these people uh, in Haiti, um, Haiti's become... Uh, a Christian nation, praise God. And we have a Jesus film team there that is uh, showing the Jesus film in the tent cities to almost a million people, and uh, revival is taking place. And it's because of people, in, pr primarily in America, Christians that were willing to donate tents and food and chickens and cows and sheep and goats and, uh, you know, seed for their garden, and people were willing to go in and help them get reestablished. And so Haiti is becoming a, a prosperous nation because of uh, the help that they're getting through uh, Christian ministries. Anyway, we were able to um, see the Lord work through us just recently in Papua. Um, we saw how people were very, very open uh, to receive Jesus. And, and you've heard about earthquakes, and they've had earthquakes there and other places. In, in Indonesia, they had a major uh, tsunami that killed uh, almost 250,000 people, and that really opened the door for Christian ministries so that uh, ministries like Helavita could go in and uh, minister to people. And so um, God is obviously in control of everything, and God is uh, opening doors that have been previously closed. Anyway, to skip down a few verses, um, in verse 12 it says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, and we're seeing that happen here, especially uh, in developed countries where people are becoming more self-centered, more uh, pleasure, uh, oriented and less concerned about their neighbor. But the Lord says, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And God knows um, know those that he has chosen, and he will be there to help you to endure to the end. Um, we may go through some uh, uh, difficult times in the future, but we know the Lord is with us, and we have nothing to fear and know that, that God will not only bring us through, but uh, he's going to make that light shine lighter as the darkness in the world gets darker. And so this is an opportune time for us as Christians to stand up and be counted for Jesus and declare who he is, that he came to set people free, he came to give them new life, give them a life filled with joy and peace and love and the assurance of going to heaven. 
And finally, in verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And that's what God's put on my heart to fulfill the Great Commission over in uh, Matthew uh, 28. Jesus gave us that mandate to um, take the gospel into all the world, he says in verse 18, and all authority has been given to me in heaven. And that means that we go in his authority in our earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so God has promised that he's with us, but he has given us this mandate, this commission, and that is to go and make disciples, to let people know that not only does Jesus love them, Jesus died for them, Jesus rose from the dead, he's alive, and he's inviting them to come and receive the greatest gift, and that is salvation and to come to know him. And that's why um, it's so important that we are able to provide, you might say, tools, Bibles, and proclaimers. Proclaimers, are, it's the audio New Testament. And a lot of these countries, like Papua, uh, the people are illiter illiterate. They do have schools there now, and the young people are learning uh, to read, but for the most part, most of the people cannot read. And so for them to hear the good news, to hear the New Testament in their language, um, they're very, very hungry for the truth. They're very open to receive uh, all that God has to give them. And we saw a very attentive audience, and we're going to see in here in a, a few minutes, um, pictures that give evidence to that. But... Before we go into these places, we need to recognize that in ourselves, we can do nothing. But in Jesus, we can do all things. And so that's why the Lord made it clear to the disciples um, over in uh, chapter 24 of Luke, um, beginning in verse 44, he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it, will, it was necessary for the Christ, that's Jesus, of course, um, he's speaking of himself, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sin shall be preached in his name to all nations. Not just a few nations, but every nation in the world. God has made it clear in Acts chapter 1 that we are to be his witnesses, even uh, in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, and that's where God is sending us. Anyway, the Lord goes on to say, and repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses to these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of in Jerusalem, and you are until you are endured with power from on high. Now that's power from the Holy Spirit. And in over in Acts uh, chapter one, as I mentioned, um, the Lord says uh, in actually the word, but this is the Lord speaking um, in verse four of Acts one. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when he had come together, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, 
Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be, you shall be my witnesses uh, to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And the end of the earth is what God has put on our hearts to go to these places where no one else goes. And uh, I'd like to just go ahead and begin with this video. You'll see uh, these pictures. You'll see um, where, what we experienced when we were in Papua. Um, it's part of Indonesia. However, um, it's not Muslim, praise God. God has opened the door uh, for Christians to minister there. And so it's become uh, pretty much a Christian nation. Uh, the majority of people are very open to the gospel. Anyway, if we could run that. Here you can see the helicopter that we were able to go to these villages in, and those are our sleeping bags and other provisions and food. Uh, that's Mike Stevens, if you'll remember him and Fawn, they used to come to this church. And there's Travis, and Travis is gonna be up here in a few minutes to minister to you. He's got a lot more pictures. And there's Dave Rose. Now this kind of gives you an idea of the remote areas where we went to, very steep um, topography, very difficult places, like I say, to get to. Um, the only way you can get there, for the most part, is by helicopter. And that's the first village where we landed on top of that knoll there. There's the equipment that we used, and the people came up to greet us, and they were very excited about us coming. And of, of course, they all came to see the Jesus film that evening. Uh, that's Tom, that's the other pilot. He's been there for over 20 years, and he speaks the language, Indonesian, very fluently. And that's Mike. This is the church, the, uh, the first village where we ministered to. Now, all the materials to build this church have come in by helicopter. And so these people are very grateful, and a lot of their uh, houses are built as well from the materials that they have provided. And there's Travis and I outside of the church. And here's the people in the village. Uh, you can see a lot of young people. And uh, I would say the average age uh, is about 15 years old. Uh, here we gave a proclaimer to the people, and they were very attentive to listen to uh, the New Testament uh, recording in their language. And this is uh, the pastor in the first village there, um, and along with a teacher. Now, this is a lady that was carrying a very heavy burden, probably over 100 pounds on her back, with this uh, special uh, bag that they have, they make there. And I, in fact, I got one of the bags. Um, this is the second village where uh, they went out with a bow and arrow and killed a pig uh, in our honor to welcome us. They feel that they have to um, you know, show th gratitude and we praise the Lord for that uh, pig that was really good uh, eating and also they gave us a lot of other gifts as well. But what they received was the greatest gift and that's what God desires for uh, everyone to have an opportunity to receive the, these gifts. Um, we're getting ready in a month. Uh, when I say we're, I'm talking about Jonathan and Patrick, one of the Bible college students, are going to go with me to Nigeria. Uh, back to Nigeria, we, I've been there twice. Uh, we have uh, already two Jesus film teams, one for the southwest portion, one for the southeast portion, and now we're going to equip and train two more teams, one for the northeast portion and one for the northwest portion. And so all of Nigeria in, in the remote villages will have an opportunity to hear and see the gospel. But 
it's so important that these people have every opportunity to grow in their uh, walk with the Lord, in their relationship, uh, in the Word. And so a lot of them cannot read, and we do provide study Bibles for the pastors, and we have a pastor's conference prior to going into these remote villages, but we give each one of the pastors in these villages, or a, a teacher of a school, a proclaimer. And that's why I would like to just give you an opportunity to invest in the kingdom of God tonight by uh, donating uh, for a proclaimer. A proclaimer costs about $75. Uh, I'm asking you to do it now because it takes about three weeks once I order it. And so uh, if you would like to, at the end of the service, um, donate whatever you feel that you would like um, to give for this, for these proclaimers, this will be uh, a great investment in heaven. You can give a Bible and save a life, but you give a proclaimer and you can save a village. And so it's just a great opportunity to minister to people. Um, when they receive one of these proclaimers, they are very appreciative, and almost everybody that uh, is in the village will come to the church and listen to the word of God. So anyway, we appreciate your help in the past and your uh, prayers, and we ask that you would continue to pray for us, and if you'd like to donate tonight, um, we won't be leaving until uh, the beginning of June, and my wife and I are going up to see our grandchildren here tomorrow. But if you would like to write a check to Joshua Springs uh, as well, um, you can designate it for Nigeria, and uh, you can take it to the office if you like, or you can drop it off here tonight. But any cash that you would like to give for this uh, investment in the kingdom of God will be greatly appreciated. And someday when you stand before God on the day of judgment, you'll see the results of what you gave. People will come up to you and say, thank you for donating. Uh, I am here in heaven because uh, you were willing to uh, not only pray, but also donate for the word of God through proclaimers and through study Bibles. Thank you and God bless you. All right, my turn. How are you guys doing? Good. I'm awesome. So Chuck and I went to Indonesia because he didn't say where we went. That was kind of suspenseful. I was waiting. But um, we went to Indonesia last month. We were there for a week, figured it out, and it was uh, eight plane rides, five helicopter rides, two different villages, I don't know how many airports, and 30,000 miles in a week. So it was pretty awesome. And um, I got a lot of photos to show you guys this evening and to share with you. I just want to share a scripture real quick before I start. It's in uh, Isaiah 52, verse 7. It says, um, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, and who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. And uh, basically, that's what Chuck and I did in Indonesia. Chuck does quite frequently. That's his, uh, his ministry the Lord has called him to, is he, as, he, as he shared, goes to those remote places. So um, in, these, <laughs> in these photos, you'll see that we did go to some remote places. And I'm going to pray real quick, and then I'm going to sit down there and narrate it. And praise the Lord, I hope they're in order. <laughs> Because the last service, you guys should have come. You missed it. It was awesome. The pictures were on the side. They were upside down. They were out of order. And I had to, I was like, oh, this is when Mike rolled the helicopter. And then here we hooked the church up and flipped it upside down. So it was interesting narrating that. So uh, hopefully it's all good this time. We'll see what happens. I'm watching you, Dylan. All right, so Lord, we just thank you. I thank you so much, God, for the opportunity to be up here. And um, Lord, please help me to glorify you as we uh, just go through this slideshow and we watch um, the things that you did in Indonesia. Lord, the things that you allowed us to be a part of. Um, God, we just love you and we thank you for the people over there. And uh, we just pray that this time is for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so if you guys want to start the, uh, the video.
It's upside down, I heard somebody say. All right, so this is when we, <laughs> this is when we got to Wamana, and we were praying at the beginning of our trip. Um, I know it looks like we're doing nothing, but trust us, it was a really tough uh, flight over there. We had some trouble in Jakarta, and the airport was pretty gnarly, and uh, I was feeling sick, and Chuck had to pray for me, so it was nice to be there. This is the hangar where Hell of Missions is located. That was the helicopter that we went out in, and that's it right there. See those two pieces of concrete? You just push that bad boy out there and turn it and then take off. So it was exciting. There's Dave Rose, and Chuck was with us, obviously. And that right there is Mike Stevens. He used to come to this church with his wife, Fawn. They're great people, amazing people. Um, can you pause it real quick? I'll tell you a, a little story about Mike. Um, he was in the military for a long time, and he was, he's a very experienced pilot. Um, and he worked for, I don't, I don't know if it was Edison doing the big power lines, stringing the, the high voltage lines. Um, he had a tremendous amount of experience. And when, he, when it came time for him to retire, he was contacted by a, a very big corporation and they wanted him to come and work for them. And this is staggering, I never knew this. And he told me when we were over there, he said that they offered him $250,000 a year and they told him that they would give him an extra 30 grand that they didn't need receipts for. And he turned it down to go to the other side of the world and fly helicopters so people could know who Jesus is. And I, that was very powerful to me. I was like, wow. And he told me, he goes, I know where that, that offer came from. You know, certainly, that, what does the devil say? Just worship me and you can have all the kingdoms of the world. But our God is greater, amen. amen. All right, so if you want to continue. And uh, they only had one helicopter going while we were there. Um, some kids broke a rotor on the other one or damaged it. You know, the rotor was $30,000 to replace, so these machines are expensive. This is us. We took off on our way to the first village. Uh, weather was really good. This is a valley. This is a valley where Waman is located. There's this really crazy river that runs through it. And uh, I took a lot of, of, you know, scenery photos because I just, I'm always amazed at what God has made. And, you know, creation, you know, testifies of his goodness and it, and it cries out. And God is just amazing. You see, there's a river down there. This river just r raging ridge, river, excuse me. There's a waterfall. There was a, an Olympic kayak, kayaker, tried to train in that river and he made it 300 yards and died. And it's one of the most radical rivers in the world. And um, there's the forest. You see people, you try to hike. It was a 45 minute helicopter ride to get where we were going. And that jungle is what you have to go through if you're going to go on foot. So it truly is a remote area, but it's, it's so beautiful. There's just every, there's waterfalls everywhere, water everywhere. Can you pause it real quick? Um, this, as you're, you know, flying through the canyons, there would be, um, you know, po populous <laughs> villages. And this is one, and this is a really good example of a landing strip. Um, Hell emissions, what they do over there, one of their main things is to go into villages that cannot be reached by an airplane. And they establish communication with the people. Most of them are friendly. There are still headhunters um, in the area. I don't, I don't know if they're cannibals. I, I, does, I mean, they're headhunters. Does it matter? Right? <laughs> so... The thing is, is that uh, I, we laugh, but I, I need to tell you this too. They have taken five missionaries to the area who have insisted that God has called them there to minister to these people and have dropped them off and none of them have come back. So that is definitely something that we can be praying for because, you know, regardless of what the sin is, God loves the person. So those people that are headhunters, God does love them and he wants the gospel to get to them. Hopefully... Maybe the missionaries, one of them's still there and, and trying to minister, but it's a rough place. That is a good example of a landing strip. It's, it's hard to tell, but it climbs probably 200 feet in that short distance, and I, I don't think it could be more than 200 feet long. Um, the pilots are just crazy. Uh, remember that landing strip, because when we get towards the end, I'll show you an uh, airplane, and I'll, I'll describe how they land on that. So go ahead and continue. Thank you. <clears throat> and then there's another waterfall. I mean, you can't go a quarter of a mile. There's a waterfall coming out of here and coming out of there. But look at the forest. It's so dense. And look at that guy. He's awesome. <laughs> he was a lot of fun. I had such a good time on the trip with Chuck. 
that's out the cockpit. Um, you know, the, they're just, you're flying through mountain ranges and those clouds, uh, they, they're constantly moving. So there is some, um, some danger, you know, they have to be on it or be on their, on their game. The pilots have to be ready. Here's a village that we flew over and this is the next village. Um, can you pause that real quick? It's so hard to, to share with you guys the, the terrain, but that is almost like straight up and down. And right there, there's a little mound, and that is where they landed this helicopter. And I think there's one more photo, and then there's a video of us kind of coming in. Maybe it'll give you a little bit of a, an idea of what these, these pilots deal with over here. So you guys go ahead. And you can see all the this right here, this is all farming. This is where they farm all of their crops. And they have to hike all the way up and down this mountain. It, it, oh, it is phenomenal. No more complaining about working for me. <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> if that video, there you go. If you look over here, you'll see there's a pretty good sized waterfall. And then you see this crown. And then coming down this way, it is extremely steep, extremely steep. There's more farms down here. And then there's actually a river, and that's where they hike down and get some of their water. And like Chuck was uh, speaking about that woman, they, they go down and get the vegetables the gar uh, from the garden. They get firewood. And it's, uh, you should see their calves, like their calf muscles, like CrossFit people over here. I know you're tough, but... Man, you got to see these people. From going up and down the side of the mountains, their calves are like eight inches wide. I mean, they're, they're, they're tough people, but they don't live very long because it's such harsh terrain and, you know, it's a difficult place to live. And then this is in the village. This is inside the, the ch this is actually their church. That is their pastor. Um, that was Pastor Joel. And again, that's Tom, one of the pilots. He's been there 20 years. He's a great man. And here's Chuck, and we're presenting... Uh, Joel, the, uh, the proclaimer, and there's Dave Rose. And this old Bible right here was actually in their language, and I don't know how old that thing was. It was, it was pretty neat. And so they read it a little bit. And in this photo and the next one, Joel's actually winding the proclaimer. So, you know, they just, they're looking at these things like, what is this? Because literally they're living 50 years out of the Stone Age. Um, I know that they have Western clothes on, but... That's, that has not been the case. If you were here a couple weeks ago when we showed, um, they, you'll see people later in the video of what they actually used to wear. And this is one of their huts, and there's a kid, and he's uh, practicing. That's, that, that's very important right there. That's a skill he needs. And this gutter right here, see the rainwater? That's where they get the water. And if you uh, have to use the restroom, hope it's not raining, because that gets slick right there. <laughs> Now, here's, a, here's from uh, down the hill looking up, and this was, I think, dinner. Um, it was sweet potatoes, the yellow, and then some roots and some green vegetables. It was so good, yeah, unbelievably good. This is in the afternoon. Every single day it rains. You see the helicopter? There's no, you cannot fly in that because you can't see, and the mountains are just treacherous and you'll crash. And uh, here's one of the villagers. Dave, Dave's hanging out with him. And this is the room we slept in. If you want to pause that for a second. Um, I slept on the left. Mike slept in the middle. And then Tom slept on the other side. And in the middle of the night, or it was probably early in the morning, I, I, uh, I woke up and I heard. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, come on. I prayed against this. Come on, Lord. And so I, I tried to go back to sleep, and I heard it again. And all of a sudden, Mike rolls over, and he goes, hear that? I go, yes, I do. And he goes, oh, don't worry, it's down below. You see how they're elevated? He goes, oh, it's, I said, oh, okay, well, when it comes up, I'll send it your way. But, <laughs> you know, they're used to it. They've, they've been there for a long time. And then these are a couple of pigs and kids are running around. I'm sorry that some of the photos are blurry. You can go ahead. <clears throat> okay, these are the bags that Chuck was talking about. And um, those things are tremendously strong. Like you can put 100, 150 pounds in them. And, and right there is, a, I meant to bring it. It was a gift, and my son ended up with it. And it's a shovel and an axe and a hoe all in one. 
and it's what they do all their work with. Now, this is the airport. Um, we ended up going to this airport because, number one, we had to get fuel. So where do you get helicopter fuel in the middle of the jungle? From these two guys in a 50-gallon drum. <laughs> and, you know, dreadlocks and all. It was, it was just awesome. They were nice guys. And, uh, okay, pause it real quick. This, this plane, I, w- I wish I could put my memory on the screen for you guys. When this guy came in, I'm going to try to show you. The runway was long. If you saw in the, one picture, in the one picture, it was a very long runway. It was, you know, a legitimate airport. When this guy came in, like if this is the runway, this, this, he came in sideways. And when I saw him, I thought he was going to crash because he's... And at the last second, I mean, he was like, I don't know, 100 feet or 50 feet off the ground. He banked it hard to the right and just went boop and landed it. And I was like, what was that? You know, because over here, it's like they'll arrest you and throw you in jail for that. And (laughs) Michael explained to me that no matter what the runway is, even if it's a good runway, um, they land that way to stay in practice because that's how critical it is over there. It's so difficult for them to land on those mountainsides. So, and that, you know, it was just, it was interesting to see that. Go ahead. And then again, this is a, I just, I thought this was the best thing. And the electric pump they pulled out of the side of the helicopter to refuel it. And this is another village on the way back. There's some reflection there. And the terrain, again, was just amazing. It's, you know, God, the things that God has created are, are just unbelievable. Right here, Pause it if you can. There's a village right here. And then if you look at this, the shape of this, I thought, wow, look at that. Like, if, was there ever a better place to build a fortress? Because these were, this was like, I don't know, 100 or 200 feet. So there's no way you could get up there to, to get to them. But you can see the little runway that they had. And it's just, it's amazing what you see in the most remote places, how, you know, what people have done. Go ahead. And this was on our way back to Wamana. Um, pause, pause that. This was unbelievable. Um, this was uh, unbelievable. See, see that little house? Can you get an, an idea in your mind how big a person would be on that screen? Like maybe the size of the dot, right? No, probably smaller than the dot. This entire mountainside was farmed. I mean, completely covered in, you can see right here, see the rocks? And each one of those was like a garden bed. The whole mountainside, it must, I don't know how big it was, but the, even the pilots were like, yeah, you know, look what they do over here. It was unbelievable. So go ahead. And it's straight up and down too. Okay, that's, that guy right there, it's a good thing that the shot's pretty far back, but that is one of the natives, and uh, they have come into town now. Uh, the only thing they wear is called a koteca. And it's basically like a tube. Is that? Yeah, that's it. And um, they are, they, they, they're cruising around. And then this was, uh, this is our second trip. This is going to the next village. Basically, we landed, got all the stuff into the, the uh, compound there, or, you know, the helicopter uh, base, plugged everything in, went, took showers, and then rushed back and, and praised the Lord. The equipment was charged and ready to go. It was just rush, rush. And so, you know, Dave and I having a good time. It was a blessing. The Lord, you know, he just, there was favor upon us. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And every time, I mean, I, I never prayed so much in my life, which was a blessing. The Lord taught me a lot. And uh, so here we are departing for the second um, village. And we're going the other way. And again, this river flows through the valley where the city of Wamana is. And you can see the clouds much more dense on the second uh, day out. And, you know, I was a little concerned. I was praying a lot more. <laughs> hey, Lord, a lot of clouds. See how the clouds, everything's closing up. And um, that's like a 15,000 foot peak. And the helicopters can't go over 14,000. See, okay, can you pause that? Because of the clouds that day, they kept trying to find a pass that they could cross over that was below 14. And as we would approach certain ones, the clouds would come in. And so they would have to go up a ridge line until they could find another place to go through. And I started getting nervous because I was like, I mean, you have to understand when you're, when you're up there in the helicopter and you haven't ever been there, it all looks the same. 
you're just like, well, we're, it's mountains. But thank God for Tom in his faithfulness of living there for 20 years because he, he knew the mountains. And uh, so there was comfort in it. But this is something else to pray for the people. Uh, right there is a landslide. And if you can go ahead and continue. And I'm, I'll tell you what, I, I, know, I know what color gold is. And that right there was gold. And so was that. And you can pause it. Yes. That's, I, I mean, I'm looking at Chuck and I'm looking at Dave and I'm like, do you see that? That's amazing. This is what we found out. The island of Papua, the government had a um, survey team come in and do soil sample, samples for the last five years. And they, found, they figured that that, uh, that land is, the, is one of the richest lands in the world, if not the richest. It has gold, copper, and silver mines all in one place. And it has oil. It's, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. They can't believe it. Let alone look at the, the plant life. The soil is just rich. And so what's happening is, is the government is mining the metal. And there have been uh, world organizations and I think like Greenpeace, I'm, I'm not sure, but like do good organizations have contacted the government and they said, hey, you're stealing from those people. You need to pay those people. And so the government said, okay, we'll pay them. And this is what's happening. The government is flying in suitcases of money to these villagers, to these, like, like the village that we went to, you know, not that specific one, but other ones where the people have never had any contact before. They don't, you know, there is no economy in that village. You know what I mean? If it is, it's, I'll trade you a pig for, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Pigs are very expensive. They're $3,000. But you guys understand what I'm saying. You know, not like over here. And so the, the pilots land and they give these guys briefcases with the equivalent of millions of U.S. dollars in them. And the, there's these tribal people and they're like, what is this? And they, well, this is money. Well, what do I, what do, what do, I do with this? Well, get, on, get on the plane, get on the helicopter and we'll take you somewhere and show you. So they bring him back to civilization and... Um, the, the people in the community, they know what's going on. And so here comes the villager to buy some bread, right? They go to buy a loaf of bread and they charge him $2,000 and just ripping them off. And so that's terrible in and of itself. And also the Papuans do not have the enzyme to, di to digest alcohol. So if they have a beer, like just a regular can of beer, they're, they're drunk for eight to 12 hours like they had a 12 pack, wasted. They, they can't function, falling down. And um, so that's very dangerous. You know, with six pack, they die. And so there, there's a lot of things that they have to deal with. You know, the enemy hates them just as much as he hates us because they are made in God's image as all men are. And he is attempting to destroy them, you know. And, and unfortunately, um, the government's intent is to draw the villagers out and in, to you know, bring them into society to where the land is abandoned, and then guess who can have the land? The government can take it. So you know, there's a lot of things that these people have to deal with. Um, just pray for pray for Papua, and pray for the villagers, pray for the people there, because uh, while that's an amazing thing to see, boy, it's causing a lot of trouble for those those folks. You know, so go ahead. It's amazing the things that we learned in such a short period of time. This uh, runway right here out of the window is the second. Uh, whoa, see, this is what happened to the first one. So Tom rolled the helicopter over, and then he, and then he, <laughs> he rolled it back. And, <laughs> and this river runs by the second uh, village. And that runway was freshly constructed. They had just finished it. And hell emissions had been there. And this is an interesting photo. It's hard to see, but... This guy and this guy, this guy has a huge bow and arrow, and the arrows were like, they were long, eight feet long arrows, and they looked serious. And the other guy has a spear, and we're like, and they're coming at us, and you know, it's funny, if you look at their faces in the pictures, they don't look happy. And then as soon as you smile, they'll smile, and, and instantly you know that everything's good, but until they smile, you're like, all right, Lord, you called me here, you know, <laughs> where are you? And then as they get closer, I laugh. <laughs> yeah, I got my cell phone and he's got his. <laughs> I'm like, hey, all right, here we go. And the cell phones are part of the people that, that they're bringing into society. 
And, you know, that's another thing. Um, pause it real quick. That's another thing to pray for is that they have this money. And as they're buying whatever, they're, you know, they're learning to purchase things, they learn about cell phones. And um, they go to buy a cell phone. And if, it, for instance, you know, I'm sure most of the problems with men, but they'll show the man a picture of a woman. And I'm not going to say any more. And they'll ask the man, do you like that? And uh, the, man, the man doesn't know any different because he's been in the jungle his whole life. He's never seen anything like that. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And then, so the man's like, well, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'm sure embarrassed, confused, doesn't know. And they, they go, okay. And they, they, they say, well, for, you know, X amount of money, we can put this on the phone. And then they load the phone with porn. And then he goes back out to the jungle and they do have solar cells so they can charge the phones. That's all they can do. But it's just, it's terrible. You know, all of these things that, that, are, that are evil that I'm speaking of, just pray. Pray against that, that, that God would overcome it. Through these people that we have, you know, shared the gospel with. So we, this is the second village and we landed and uh, we went inside and we were kind of setting up and getting ready uh, to get going. And these little kids popped their head in the door and the little girl, go ahead and, and the next one. I was like, oh, that's the coolest hat ever. So I had to get a picture. Go ahead and there. <laughs> and they make those. There's some kind of a crazy bird that has some nine-inch talon or something that doesn't fly like a dinosaur that runs around, and they, they catch them and make, you know, they use their claws and all kinds of stuff. So here's a proclaimer. And um, again, in the next village, and this lady here in the purple was actually, she was a teacher, and so was the man in the red and the white, or red and uh, blue shirt, the, the older gentleman on the right with the gray beard, he was the pastor. And um, he'd been there for, uh, nobody knew how long. So this was a, a great blessing, uh, blessing to them because many of them can't read, although they did have teachers in this village to help them, and, uh, which was just great. And so I, I, just, I took a photo of this lady and her little girl, and I showed her little girl the photo, and she was like, whoa, that is a papaya. Yeah. Oh, oh, it was huge. And this is the room that we slept in and fellowshiped in, had the movie in. Notice the nice tight floor where nothing can get in. Yeah, yeah, yeah safe place to sleep, you know, no problems. <laughs> Amen. Now that is a banana plant. And I just like, see that right there? That's a flower and there's all the bananas. And I don't know, some of you guys might be like, why are you taking pictures of that? I just think it's, God's amazing. And there's a helicopter, and it, it, there's the runway that we landed on, the Indonesian flag. And if you look, there's the papayas. There must have been 30 or 40 of those things on those trees. The soil is just so rich over there. And it just, it was amazing. Yeah, what, ooh, ooh. Hey, you sleep on that floor, and you'd be thankful those guys were there, because nothing flew in there that night. They caught them, you know. There was all kinds of stuff in their webs. Although I didn't mess with it because on the bottom side of it was an hourglass, just like a black widow, but it was orange. And I went, yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, they, you know, they just told us, you know, certain things with malaria and things you just, you, you protect yourself from. If you go on a missions trip, usually your doctor would tell you ahead of time, don't do this, don't do that, be careful of this, so... They prep you. Now this, okay, so they were so excited for, that we came to see them and that Hell Missions had helped them to build a runway so that they could, you know, be ministered to and, and receive support and stuff. They decided, um, like Chuck said, they were going to kill a pig. Now again, earlier I said, a pig is $3,000 over there. It's extremely valuable. Um, so for them to kill this pig was like them saying, you know, treating us like royalty. And, you know, while I was there, that guy right there was gnarly. I had, I mean, seriously, that's, that guy's a man's man. He had this hatchet and he was cutting up those boards. Uh, unbelievable with his feet, using his feet and everything, stepping on the burnt logs. And he's like, yeah, no problem. And then here, look at the kids. If there's any kids in here, pay attention. You start helping out. Where's my kids? <laughs> And then here's the pig. They brought, they brought the pig, a full-on pig, you know. And um, this is called a bakar baktu. And I'm not sure if he shot it or not, but what they do is they, 
they get a fire going, they throw the pig on there, and they cook, or they, they burn all the hair off. And then after the hair is burned off, look at this guy's a joker. Pause that real quick. Here's another thing to pray about. This guy, it's hard to see, but his mouth is red. And um, these people don't leave this village. Like they're, it, this is an, another 45 minutes, an hour flight. But there's some sort of powder there or it's not powder, it's, a, it's coral. It's ground up coral, and they shove it in their gums, and it cuts their gums open and makes them bleed. But then there's some sort of a plant or something they shove in their mouth, and it's a drug. And it, because their gums are bleeding, it absorbs whatever, the, uh, uh, whatever the, the, the content of the plant is. You, know, you understand? And, and it gives them like a euphoric feeling, you know, gets them high. So I thought to myself, you know, even in the middle of nowhere, the enemy still will attack you know, still causes trouble. So don't think that just because they live in the middle of nowhere, they don't have any problems because they do. They definitely have problems. And so anyways, he's, he's getting the hair off of the pig. Go ahead. Anyways. Okay. So here's the, here's the pig. They're, they're cleaning it up. And, um, there's a few graphic photos, but not too many, not too many. These rocks right here, they take those rocks and they put them on that big fireplace and, uh, they get them hot to the point of where they almost explode. Michael cutting that pig open and Dave also is an honor. Like only the, the, the hunters and the elders get to do that. And it was a blessing and Dave jumped right in there. He had no problems doing it. Which if you know Dave Rose, that's, that's part of why I love that guy. He's a good guy. There he is, he fits right in. So there's the pig all butchered up. And I spared you. I have like probably 50 photos that I didn't put in here. And in the meantime, they killed the chicken for us and barbecued that thing up. And there's Dave eating the chicken. <laughs> and it was, it was good. It was a little chewy, but it was good. Praise God, it was. <laughs> and then uh, inside, while we're outside, you know, hanging out with the people and they're doing the, the barbecue thing, uh, Michael and uh, Tom and Chuck were inside getting ready and preparing. And as you can see, everybody gets together and helps, which was, it was nice to see that, you know, that's something we don't see here in the States anymore. Like Chuck said, everybody's so self-centered that um, you just don't see that anymore. So God ministered to me many ways through these people. He showed me many things. And uh, here's Tom and everybody setting the equipment up. And the blessing about this equipment is we left it there. So hell emissions, hey, yeah. yes, I had anti-gravity boots on. <laughs> Chuck had a pair. <laughs> practicing to be pilots. <laughs> and, um, but the Hell Emissions has the equipment, and they will continue to go out and show it to these villages, remote, isolated villages, especially the ones only the helicopters go to. And that bowl is more sweet potatoes and root, and it was very good. It was very good. So here, the pig is in here, and it has these stones that they heated on the fire. They put down banana leaves in the hole, and then they put stones, and then banana leaves, and then the pig, and then banana leaves, and then more stones, and then cover it. And then it cooked for about two hours, and during that time period, um, Chuck shared uh, a tract with them that was uh, the message of the gospel and salvation. And you can see they were eager. I mean, they were very open and, and uh, willing to hear and to listen. And so um, there's the fire going out, and the, there's the barbecue right there. And um, see everybody? Uh, he, has, he has a tract in his hand, and so Chuck was getting ready to, to share. So this is afterwards. Um, pause it real, for a second. Okay. In the track, at the end, the people accept the Lord. And when they do, they go like this, and they put a finger up. And that's how the tract was written. And when we get to the end, which we're, we're getting close, I want you to remember that because it was just really neat. You'll see what I mean. And okay, so here the barbecue's done. Praise the Lord for Tom because he knew what meat to grab. I was like, all right, Lord, can we have something done? <laughs> you know, and uh, you just, you don't want to get sick or anything over there. And um, that, that was actually good. That barbecue was good. It was a little chewy, but boy, it was good. So, and Tom's been there 20 years. He's retiring in nine months. And uh, they're, you can go ahead and continue. They're, at, they're talking to Michael about taking over a uh, head pilot, you know, and there's a lot of things going on. The enemy is, is, is at work amidst the, uh, you know, the uh, congregation they have there at Hell, Hell of Mission. So just pray for them, for God's will to be done. 
And then, um, see that dog? Oh, you saw the dog, right? Yeah. Back it up real quick. Please, if you don't mind, can you do that? I know you guys can do everything up there. Whoa, that was really far. Well, the dog, let me tell you, if you look, there's, um, if you look in almost every picture of the barbecue, there's dogs. And they are squirrely. You have to watch them. They sneak up behind you and grab the food. See, there's one there, and there's one there. And um, it was funny. There, see, he was, he's waiting. Look, there's a tail. See, I'm telling you, they're all over the place. And then uh, it was just, it was, you know, they're hungry too. And so anyways, here, afterwards, this is the end of the showing of the film. Do you see the people's hands? All their fingers are up. Yeah, praise God, because, you know, from what Chuck shared out of that tract, and watching the Jesus film, they clearly understood. And, you know, they're like, right here, Lord, I, I just want to give my life to you. And, and it was such a blessing to see that. Here's another photo. Same thing. You can see all the little fingers sticking up. So, you know, praise God for all those people, new believers, you know. And this was uh, early the next morning, a little foggy. Now, here... Here's the study Bible that we were able to leave with this village because um, at this village, one of the teachers, I think it was at least one, was able to speak the language that this Bible was written in. Now, uh, just a side note, I didn't get any pictures of Craig, but Craig was an individual that's from Michigan. He's an American, and he has been over there for, uh, oh my goodness, two, at least two years, maybe as many as six. I can't remember. But um, Craig lives with the villagers and his wife and his three kids. And they have for, you know, I, th I think it's six years he's been there. And um, they live, like that's where they live is with those people. And not these people, but you guys know what I mean, a, a different village. Because there was, uh, oh my gosh, I think it's 225 villages and over 600 languages within those villages. In, in where we went. Yeah, so there's plenty of uh, opportunity to minister there. And um, basically, uh, Craig, the, the village where Craig lives, nobody, their, their language is not, isn't known. So he is there learning their language and trying to translate a Bible, so the New Testament, so that they can, they can hear the, the message of the gospel. So it's phenomenal. So here's our trip back. And um, pray for Craig and his family. And uh, again, that looked like oil to me. It might have just been a two huge pools on top of a mountain. And see that discolored stuff right there? I I'm telling you, you just look down and you see things that stand out. That, like, th that was a copper brass color. There was another one. You can see the coloring. And the land is just so rich. Look at the river that runs through it. And this is a good, you can tell the valley here and the mountains around it. There's another one of those pools. I mean, it's just phenomenal. You know, God's uh, created a wonderful place over there full of a lot of good people. Um, so we're getting to the end here. And then I know it's about time to go. It, in, the, yeah, in the next photo, there's an upright post that you'll see to the left. It's kind of gray. And what it is is right there, in the, the Indonesian government uh, was paying Japanese Muslims Java. to... Oh, what's that? Java. Javanese, Javanese Muslims to come in to immigrate and to convert the Christians to Muslims. And go ahead to the next uh, uh, photo and see that power? The people in Wamana, like here's a lesson we could learn. <laughs> the people in Wamana said, no, we are Christians and we're going to erect this gigantic cross where you want to build a mosque. Because we're not having that. Yeah, so praise God for those people there in Wamana. And um, they were just working on the cross, I can't, or the crossbar, but go ahead. <clears throat> I think we're just about done. Yeah, and this is, that's the hangar. This is when we landed. I think there's one more short video. Just got back from the second trip out, and everything was great, so thank you God for a good trip. So good to us. Hmm. So just what a blessing, you know. If you want to serve the Lord, all you have to do is be willing. And he'll take you anywhere in the world. There's the hangar. And, um, you know, 
there's a need for missionaries. This is our, our trip back. It was a blessing. We had a lot of fun. And uh, I just want to encourage you guys, if you, if you are able to share, uh, or I mean to donate to the Proclaimers, um, MAF is uh, 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 an aviation ministry, Mission Aviation, I can't remember, it's MAF. Mission Aviation Fellowship. Um, they were over there right next to uh, Hella Missions or Hella Vida. They're a great, great uh, organization, you know. So, missions. Give to missions because you see the people out there. They need to hear the gospel. And if you can't go or you don't want to go, that's fine. God didn't call everybody to go. But there are those of us that will go. And pray for us because... It might be the last time we go one of these times, but you know what? There's no greater thing than to lay down your life for a friend, right? And, and God is good. So thank you for listening, and uh, pray real quick.